Welcome to the Athenaeum. We're here to hear Gaston Espinosa, who is going to give his talk on religion, race, and the 2016 election, evangelicals, Jews, Latinos, and the future of, the American, uh, of American politics. Gaston Espinosa is the Arthur Slaughton Professor of Religion at Claremont McKenna, obviously, and co-editor of the Columbia University Press Series in Religion and Politics. He is the author of eight books. I'll only highlight two for this lecture. He has a book on religion, race, and Barack Obama's new democ democratic pluralism. And he has a book on religion and the American presidency, George Washington to George W. Bush. Espinosa's talk will also address the candidates' religious and racial ethnic upbringing, personal views on religion and race, as well as select party platforms related issues. He will serve, he will also, I'm sorry, he will also share survey and poll findings about how the American electorate is leaning in this election based on race, religion, and gender. Espinosa is currently researching and writing about Latino religions and politics in American public life and the spiritual impulses of the Mexican American Civil Rights Movement. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Gaston Espinosa. <clears throat> Well, I want to thank Maria and Priya and the Athenaeum for sponsoring this event. Thank you all for coming out. I know you're very busy, and your time is very precious and valuable to me and to each person who's here, so thank you. What I'd like to do today is share with you some reflections and findings. Over the last 14 years, I've done three national surveys of U.S. Latinos in 2000, funded by the Pew Charitable Trust, 2008, 2000, and 2012. I hope to do one in 2016. Right now we're in the fundraising component of that. And what I'd like to do is share with, share with you some reflections on the religious backgrounds and the role that religion and race play in the elections. You know, there's been a lot of press recently about the decline of religion in America and how we live in a, how we live in a post-racial America. But I'm not so sure that's true, that either are true. I mean, if we're post-racial, what does it mean? All the riots that are taking place in Baltimore and Ferguson, all the struggles over immigration reform. If it's post-religious, why are we seeing the growth of religion not only in the US but around the world, especially among more conservative uh, varieties of religion? They're actually growing. They're not declining. Though those that are declining are the, are the more traditional versions. So there's a lot of shifts taking place in the country. And what I'd like to do is try to map out a few of them. I need to warn you, I'm very data heavy. So lots of graphs and charts. I apologize for that up front. But that's what I do, and I hope you don't mind. So what I'd like to do is begin by looking at some of the questions we'll explore today. So what are the current national poll survey averages? So where do the candidates stand? Who's leading by what? What do they look like? Give you the big picture. Why is the racial ethnic electorate important? This is a very important question. Uh, again, because there's this surge in the populations of racial ethnic minorities in America, and there's a tendency to not recognize that because we don't have a lot of leadership in government, primarily at the governor's mansions and in the Senate and in even, even, on, even in many of the courts, state courts, et cetera. So we don't realize the shift that's taking place. It's seismic, but it's taking place largely underground. One day, people will wake up and say the world has changed, but it's always changed. It's always been there. We simply haven't noticed it. So. What are the religious upbringings and identities of the candidates? This is very important, and we'll see why religion actually is an important variable for the candidates and for the electorate. Why is religion important in presidential politics, not just politics in general? How are people leaning in their vote by religion and by gender? And what assets and liabilities do each of the candidates have going into the election? And what are the potential pathways to victory for each candidate? I'll open, it, I'll open that up for discussion. So that'll be your opportunity to offer your insights about those pathways you think might be helpful and important. OK, so let's begin. So national polling averages right now, Trump leads Cruz by seven percentage points, with Kasich rounding out the rest. I mean, Cruz has really picked up steam in large part because Rubio dropped out. But there are other reasons for that. Uh, Cruz picks up support 
from evangelical voters, many of whom were actually leaning toward Rubio. A lot of evangelical voters, uh, excuse me, leaders like um, Rick Warren, Saddleback Community Church, who has a book that sold 40 million copies. President Obama spoke at his church twice, endorsed Rubio. And a lot of other evangelical leaders actually backed Rubio, not Cruz. So now that Rubio was out, we're seeing a shift in those voters over into the Cruz column. So Cruz, his, his uh, numbers are growing. Hillary leads Sanders 50 to 43. These numbers are as of yesterday, averages as of yesterday, from realclearpolitics.com. And these average out about 10 or 15 polls over the course of the last two weeks. We see that Sanders has really picked up steam as well. And Sanders is really putting up a ferocious fight for the nomination. I don't think most people thought Sanders had a chance about five or six months ago, to be honest at least insiders. Nobody thought that was a serious issue or Sanders was a serious contender, but they've changed their mind. And now a lot of the superdelegates have to decide how they're going to vote and who they're going to align with if Sanders actually closes the gap enough to make it a contested convention, which is unlikely, but always possible. So in current races, in both cases, the incumbent, so to speak, Trump and Clinton are leading in the three big states with Trump and Sanders both leading in Wisconsin. So, you know, each in, in both cases, you have these outsider candidates, you know, chipping off a state or two along the way. And their number of electoral uh, support is growing. Their electoral support's growing. In head to head matchups, Hillary's moving ahead of Trump by significant margins. She's at almost 11% above Trump. And that's why the, Repub the Republican establishment is very worried. Because they're saying at 11%, how do you make that up you know, in the course of six months? It's going to be almost impossible to do that. Cruz is doing a little bit better, although Hillary's still ahead of him by three percentage points. That's doable, because the margin of error is two to, two to three percentage points on these polls. So he's within a one or two points of matching or tying Hillary. So he's more of a threat, for lots of reasons I'll talk about later. And, but she trails Kasich. But Kasich has the benefit of being the new kid on the block. We don't know much about him. He seems compassionate, almost like a, a blue-red Republican, right? He's you no know, blue in heart and red in, in, in political uh, vote, in terms of how he votes. And he's got that uh, compassionate conservative piece going that seems more authentic in many ways. But once the dust clears, I think he'll be struggling just like Trump is now. So what role will, will race play? The electorate, is, as you've seen, has, has gone down. The number of white Americans has gone from 78% of the electorate to 69% in the course of 16 years. And that's going to continue to drop off significantly over the next 20 years. So there's no going back to the period where the Euro-American population could dominate the electorate. That's never going to happen again. So now each party has to decide what are they going to do in light of these demographic shifts taking place? And so race is a permanent factor in American electoral politics. It's not optional anymore, not something you can kind of write off by going through the Midwest, which was uh, Romney's strategy, or going kind of East Coast Midwest to Pennsylvania, which was McCain's strategy. Bush won because he went through the Southwest and he actually targeted Latinos and others to win. He, he actually you know, did something that was counterintuitive, right? He played the Southwest and the race and religion card quite well. In a book I have called Religion, Race, and the American Presidency, not mentioned earlier, that maps out how Bush did that. And the other book on Obama maps out how Obama did it, with different chapters on different groups. So notice that the Latino and the black electorates are now the same size. So in the past, the Democratic establishment had to pay a lot of attention to African Americans, and they should, because they're the bedrock of the Democratic establishment. They vote overwhelmingly Democrat. 90 to 95 percent of African Americans support the Democratic Party. It's almost impossible to, to, to separate the group. Uh, the, the Latino population has been more fluid, in large part because 38 percent of the population is immigrant. So there, there's a, a million new Latino voters every four years. Some, some people estimate four million new Latinos, but a million new voters who don't have any political history that are up for grabs. And that's why the Republicans in the past have gone after them. The last two candidates, the pre prior elections, didn't really do that. 
And we saw what happened, I think, as a result, I would argue in part, because they didn't do that. But what's most important is this, all racial ethnics together now make up one third of the electorate. That's a gigantic piece of the puzzle. Now, that's even compounded more significantly because they're densely uh, located in key swing states like Florida, New Mexico, Colorado, Virginia, North Carolina, where you have large populations of African Americans and Latinos. So the 31% is only one piece of the puzzle. It's also the densely, dense populations of racial minorities in key swing states. It increases their value. And this is why they're so important for electoral, um, electoral politics. All right. The only problem is, and the one thing that Republicans bank on, is the voter turnout. So in 2012, only half of Latinos and Asian Americans turned out to vote. So that actually undercut their potential impact in terms of numbers. That's always been an, a variable and an issue, in large part because of work and, and language issues, issues about just having the time to get involved in electoral politics. But that's been something that the community's been trying to address, the Democratic establishment's been trying to address, and Republicans tried to address back in 2000 and in 2004, but have more or less walked away from it since 2004 because they've written off the Latino electorate as largely voting Democrat, and they do. But what they fail to remember is that in Texas, Florida, New Mexico, and other states like that, a large share can swing over and vote Republican by as much as 20 points uh, in, in one election cycle among Latino evangelicals, for example which is a fast-growing part of the population. I'll talk more about that in a bit. The growth, of racial, the, growth, the growth of the racial ethnic electorate from 2012 to 2006, so the Euro-American electorate grew by 2%, blacks by 6, Asians by 16, Latinos by 17%. So in the course of just one election cycle, you have a 17% increase in the number of Latinos in the electorate. Just do, just, if you start doing the math, every four years, what's that gonna look like in 24 years? I mean, that's, I mean, it's not gonna be that big. <laughs> there will be some tapering off, but that's gigantic. I mean, this is, these are big numbers. Even if you control for low turnout, these are significant percentages and numbers that you have to pay attention to, especially in swing states. And I think that some of the presidential candidates are really keen in on this and others are struggling to do this. Check this out right here, 10.7 million new eligible voters. Of that, 76% were, were minority voters. 76% of all the new eligible voters in America are racial ethnic minority. And that trend's not gonna taper off. There's no reason to see that drop off anytime soon because of high birth rates among immigrant populations which tend to be minority. So, high, you know, high birth rates plus high immigration rates are like compound interest. They grow the population exponentially, especially in key states, and really, really increases the saliency of those communities. Why else does race ethnicity matter in 2016? If the Republican gets only 17% of the non-white vote like Romney did in 2012, then Trump would need 65% of the white vote, something only done by Ronald Reagan. George Bush took only 58% of the white vote. So what's the likelihood that Trump's gonna take more? Uh, and 26% of the non-white vote. However, Bush's formula would not work today because of the growth rates and percentages of racial minorities. So racial ethnic minorities were only 22% of the electorate when Bush ran. Now they're 31%. But as we're gonna see in a minute, they're, they're voting heavily Democrat by a margin of two or three to one. So when you start adding the number up and do the math on this, it becomes a tough formula for Republicans to break through. Bush did it, and he did it well in many ways. Talk his policies aside for a moment. Just in terms of outreach to Latinos and even Asian Americans, he took 44, 44 to 40 to 40 percent of the Asian American vote. Latino and Asian American votes are very similar, voting for Bush. And so how did he do that? John Kasich represents more of that kind of early Bush approach of welcoming people from different ethnic backgrounds, talking about race, 
Bush was a border governor too, so he had to. And he had the president of Mexico visit his house many times, which helped with a lot of Latino voters. Not a majority, but enough to win. And that's the key. Favorability by race for Clinton and Sanders. Sanders has a higher favorability rating among whites than Clinton. So that's good news, Sanders is doing well. However, Clinton has a higher favorability rating than Sanders among blacks by 29% and among Latinos by 24%. Those are big percentages that are gonna be tough. Um, and they also help to undercut the argument that Bernie Sanders could make that, you know, I can actually win a general against Hillary because I'm polling better, he could argue. But then the counter argument is, yeah, but minorities who are key to our democratic winning coalition actually are voting for Hillary by 20 to 30% more. So if we actually vote for you, it actually puts some of those voters in play for Trump or Cruz to possibly pick off or Kasich. So those are the pros and cons of that particular piece, that data point, how it becomes a potential problem. Latino political party ID. So what percentage of, of all Latinos you think are Democrats? Somebody guess. 65, okay. Republican, 80, okay. 84. How about Republican? 30, 10, 40, we are, we are creative. 10 to 40, 41, push 41. No, okay, all right. So, I mean, if it was 41, this would be a totally different election, okay? I mean, I mean like gigantically different. Let's take a look. So, Demo so Latinos, only 51% of Latinos say they're Democrats. That's a very important figure. Republicans, not in the previous elections very well, but the Bush team really zeroed in on that fact because it actually hasn't changed. I did a survey in 2000 of 2,300 Latinos, and it was around 49% said they were Democrats. So it hasn't grown very much. 2% in 16 years isn't a big growth pattern. 14% are Republican. That's actually down from 18%. So there's been slippage there. Uh, unsure independent, 32%. I would circle that number, right? That number means that people have to pay attention to Latinos because they're important. And they're also important in key states that you wouldn't imagine, like Georgia, which is actually much closer than people realize, North Carolina, Virginia. If you look at the margins of victory in North Carolina and Virginia, look at the percentage of Latinos who were in the electorate, about two to five percent. You look at the percentage of support for Obama, you see a margin of victory right there. So they can only be a small percentage of a state population in Georgia, North Carolina, or Virginia, but be a deciding factor because they vote overwhelmingly Democrat. Very, this is why race matters. These pieces are important. We'll talk about how to reach minority voters in a minute. That's where religion comes in. Yeah. So Latino vote matchup, February 2016, Clinton against Cruz. Right, just gigantic, you know, uh, among Latinos now, not general population. Cruz, you know, does the best outside of Rubio, but still struggling among Latinos. Now keep in mind that Bush took between 40 to 44 percent of the U.S. Latino vote in 2004, and McCain took 31 percent. Romney took between 24 and 27 percent of the Latino vote in 2000 in 12, so Cruz is polling about average a little bit better. Trump is not doing well for reasons that are not hard to imagine. Um, Rubio actually is more, would have been more of a threat, and Jeb Bush would have actually done quite well among Latinos, but he got knocked out, and you know, if, if I'm Clinton, I'm thinking, thank God. You know, because if his wife starts giving speeches in Spanish, he's from Florida, if he takes Florida, she's Mexican-American, they met in college, she could leverage some of the cultural capital, maybe it's just pull off Colorado or New Mexico, then we have another 2004 possible repeat. But he just didn't, he didn't garner the support of the establishment Republicans who were upset about a whole range of issues, immigration being one of them. They didn't listen to Bush Jr. We actually tried to get immigration reform passed in 2006. There was a poll done, because I, I, I know the pollster, who said that if Bush had gotten immigration reform passed in 2006, when President Bush actually pushed for it, Latinos would have been polling 50% Republican. 
Because all those that have been grandfathered in would have leaned or possibly switched over to vote Republican. That's a gigantic piece of data. So, that, so when immigration reform did not pass, it wasn't just sad for moderate Republicans. I mean, it was a happy moment for Democrats, too. They did not want Bush to get that passed under any circumstances. If you look at the actual polling data by, by generation, if you look at the Reagan generation, those Latinos that were naturalized under Ronald Reagan in 1986, 2.7 million immigrants were naturalized. He passed an immigration. They called it an amnesty bill back then, right? Now, Reagan wasn't supportive of it, but he still took credit for it. 2.7 million people were, were naturalized. There's a, there's a plus 10% Republican vote for that generation that were brought in under Reagan. And by the way, a lot of Cubans were brought in, brought in under Eisenhower, who was also a Republican. So whoever brings you into the electoral system actually does gain some benefit from doing that. That's why Obama's pushing real hard to try to get something passed before his, his time is done. Although he could have passed it in the first two years, and that's, that's a point of stress in the relation between Latinos and Obama when he had control of the House and the Senate. The first two years, he had, could do whatever he wanted to. He said, the first year, I'll do it, I promise. The first year, he didn't do it. Long memory, but they're still loyal Democrats, so anyways. Okay, Clinton, Kasich, Sanders, Cruz, you know, Sanders still doing quite well, Sanders versus Trump, same as Hillary and Sanders versus Kasich. So we, we see the Latino vote matchup. Latinos are gonna vote heavily Democrat by wide margins. The only person that could really change that up possibly are Kasich and, Rupe, and, Cru, and Cruz, in my opinion, for reasons I can explain later. Clinton beat Sanders two to one among Latino Democrats. So Sanders got an uphill battle among Latinos, but she, he's working on it. Latinos are key in these key swing states. So let's take a look at the growth of the Latino population. We talk a little bit more about race here. Why are Latinos important? So in 2050, the white population is going to decrease from 69% now to 52%, 52.8, Latino population is going to spike up to 24%. So one out of four Americans are going to be Hispanic heritage. Latino heritage picked the term that you like best. Notice by 2100, a third, the white population is dropping off precipitously now. So we're seeing massive demographic shifts, and they're actually taking place right now. If you go to the elementary schools here in Claremont, you don't got to go to Montclair Pomona. Just go to the elementary schools right here and look at the playgrounds. They're heavily racial and minority. The country is going through gigantic shifts right now, and we're playing catch up. How do we catch up in terms of this leadership capacity? Because there are leadership deficits in the Latino and black and other ethnic communities because we haven't had the cultural capital, money, educational resources to advance. There have been efforts have been made, and that's why it's important for colleges like the Claremont Colleges, all of them, and I know some are doing what they can to really address these issues head on, because this is the future, especially if you're a college that claims to do work in politics and economics, because the labor force is really, really heavily ethnic minority. And the political system is just going to be such that you can't win an election by understanding this kind of cultural, uh, cultural literacy, the ability to talk about things in a cadence and a spirit that people in the community recognize. And that's really important. You can't fake that stuff very well. Either you have to have contacts with the community or you don't. And if you do, you know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, because it's part of who you are. If you don't, you struggle, and people catch that struggle, and they say you're an outsider. You're a perennial outsider. Not going to work. So U.S. Latino diaspora in 2011, the number of states hasn't changed. It's grown a little bit. But these are the states where Latinos are the largest minority groups. Largest minority group, Latinos. What do you notice about that, about that map? Anything stand out to you? Yes. Southwest. The Southwest, by big numbers. 38% California, 47% New Mexico, 30% Arizona, 38 in Texas, 27% Nevada, 21% in Colorado. Sound familiar? Those are a lot of key swing states. Anything else stand out to you about the map? There should be two other things, at least two, yeah. Pocket of the Northeast, all of New England. In every state of New England, Latinos are the largest minority group today. That's a big shift. People don't think of New England being, Latinos being the largest minority group in New England? In every state? Yes. Every state. I was in Vermont, in Hanover, New Hampshire, 
I went into a Chinese restaurant. I heard Spanish being spoken. I said, oh, I'm home, right? I, you know, I'm back in the Southwest. It was in a Chinese restaurant in Vermont. <laughs> Guatemalan immigrants were cooking Chinese food. It was just, it's just remarkable. Chain migration works like this. So the population is just expanding outward. And notice Florida. Right now, Georgia, the fastest growing Latino populations are North Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia in terms of raw percentages. So the population is really, really growing fast. So it's, it's a population that's worth paying attention to, all worth paying attention to. African Americans are really key to political capital. Asian Americans are also quickly growing, very rapidly actually. Some, some years they're growing faster than Latinos as a percentage, not raw numbers. Role of gender in the 2016 election, March 2016, CNN ORC poll found that 73% of voters had a negative opinion of Trump. That's probably not surprising, but let's get the number out there. Majority of Republican women want, wanted Trump to win the nomination. They probably still do. Trump supports, support among men is 7% higher than women. There's clearly a gender gap has always been with Republicans. George W. Bush closed that gap quite a bit. I think it was within two percentage points, which was significant. But normally it's five to seven points or more between Democrats and Republicans in terms of women. And women are a greater part of the electorate. They're about 52% of the electorate. So you have, to, you have to add up all these pieces to see the power of women right, in terms of the electorate. They're a higher percentage. Republicans have to carve in some, but they're already a disadvantage because of just raw percentages and numbers. So it's hard for them to catch up. Trump doesn't help. Now Kasich would do, I think, well among women. Trump struggles a bit for reasons that are clear. In a matchup against Hillary, 60% of women said they would support Hillary, 33% 33% said Trump. This compares to 50% for Trump and 45% for Clinton among men. So American men are much more likely to support Trump, just across the board, just Democrats, Republicans in general, average them all out. So Trump does have support. He's got a base, and it is gendered. Hillary also beats Cruz by 15% among women, and Kasich by 7%, which is a lot closer. In 2012, women voted for Obama versus Romney by 11%. And Romney had some appeal among women, but still, 11% is a gigantic percentage when you do the 51, 52, 48 breakdown of the electorate by gender. Really, it's not 11%. It's actually more like 16%. I mean, just in terms of percentages and turnout, so it's a problem. In 2004, Bush took 40% of women. Bush Senior, Bush senior took 50%. So there, has been, there have been times when the Republican candidates have done well or kind of held their own with women. But the last, there's been slippage. So what are the presidential candidates' religious identities? So Hillary Clinton's a United Methodist. She was born and raised a Protestant. She grew up in a church. She was an altar girl. She helped the pastor at the altar, set the altar up for Sunday morning services. Um, she claims she believes in God. Many of her writings, actually, she states this quite openly, and she really focuses on faith and social justice. So she sees a faith that's active and alive, working on behalf of the marginalized. Right? Jesus more of a revolutionary than he was just a quiet teacher. The most important commandment is to love the Lord your God, the Lord with all your might, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, this is what we are commanded to do, or commanded by Christ to do. So she believes that Christ calls her to love her neighbor. And that's one of the things she cites a lot in her speeches, this loving of the neighbor. And the neighbor includes those that are marginalized. So she ties that to social justice. I'm a person of faith. I'm a Christian, Clinton said. I'm, an, I'm a Methodist. I've been raised a Methodist. I feel very grateful for the instructions and support that I received starting in my family, but throughout my church. So she really does connect with the church. Bernie Sanders, a secular Jew, does not practice religion, but he believes in God. So it's not true that Sanders is an atheist. Some people have said that, that he's... Actually, he does believe in spirituality. And he, he, he attended Hebrew school as a child, was bar mitzvahed, lived in a kibbutz in Israel, and actively both criticizes Netanyahu for his anti-Palestinian policies and also criticizes Hamas. So, so he's someone in the middle. I'd like to go now to a clip. Is my friend Mitch here? Nope. I hope I don't lose my space. I want to show you a little 
statement by Bernie Sanders. Find out how the cursor moves. Hmm. from Denise Gaddis. She grew up here in Flint, Michigan. She says she's undecided on a candidate. She's got a question uh, for Senator. Actually, she's got two questions. First one is for Senator Sanders, then she'll ask another question to Secretary Clinton. Denise? Thank you. Senator Sanders, do you believe that God is relevant? Why or why not? Well, I think, well, the answer is yes. And I think when we talk about God, whether it is Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Buddhism, what we are talking about is what all religions hold dear, and that is to do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. I am here. Just stop there. So he, he goes on to talk a little bit more about that, and he ties it to his his political views and his social justice views. Let's see here. I'll get that to go to full screen. Here? Here's the zoom. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so we see Bernie Sanders does talk about religion, even though he himself is secular. His his brother said he's he's hardly religious at all, which is not hurt him so much in the primary. I think it would become more of an issue actually in the general election, and I'll show you why in a minute here. Let's take a look. So, but before we get there, let's move on to our next person. So, spiritual in his own way. His second wife. His first wife is Jewish, his second wife is, his current wife is Catholic. She's the president of a college, and so he does respect Catholicism, a deep respect for Catholicism, and admires Pope Francis, calls him a, a courageous defender of, 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 of justice and faith. He said, I am beautifully motivated, I'm motivated by, excuse me, by a vision which exists in all great religions, which is so beautifully and clearly stated in Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule, a quote that he gave in one of his presentations. Donald Trump uh, grew up Presbyterian in a Christian Reformed church, uh, believes in God, attends church on occasion, and uh, he criticizes Islam as we know, but he also criticized Pamela Geller um, for hosting the Draw the Prophet event and called it disgusting. So Bush is kind of this, I mean, uh, Trump is kind of this contradiction, right? So he can qu be quite critical of what he calls radical Islam, but at the same time criticize people who are making caricatures of Prophet Muhammad that you would think he'd be okay with. So he's, he's an interesting person. Let's hear what he has to say about religion here. Just a second. Let's go to... So we've got people lined up for questions. I just got one more, because you used the word Christian. Have you ever asked God for forgiveness? That's a tough question. I, I don't think in terms of, I have, I'm, I'm a religious person. Shockingly, because people are so shocked when they find this out. Uh, I'm Protestant, I'm Presbyterian. And I go to church and I love God and I love my church. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. Everybody's heard of Norman Vincent Peale. He was so great. He would give a sermon, you never wanted to leave. Sometimes we have sermons, and every once in a while we think about leaving a little early, right, even though we're Christian. <laughs> Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, Frank, would give, a survey, would give a sermon. I'm telling you, I still remember his sermons. It was unbelievable. And what he would do is he'd bring real-life situations, modern-day situations, into the sermon. And you could listen to him all day long. When you left the church, you were disappointed that it was over. He was the greatest guy. And then... You know, he passed away, but he was a great... The, the, he wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. Okay. So there is actually a very important moment, right? Because we hear, you know, Trump's notion, positive thinking, I can do all things. He's got this kind of entrepreneurial spirit and attitude. 
he would argue that it was shaped in part by his religious upbringing, right? Because his pastor was one of the most famous religious teachers of the, the period. Norman, Norman Vincent Peale's books, The Power of Positive Thinking, has sold millions and millions of copies. I mean, it has been a bestseller for decades. So that was somebody that he would have been shaped and influenced by in terms of how he sees the world. You can do anything. Anything is possible in this world. And people get in the way, don't let them block you from getting what you want or what God wants you to have. So he, I, you know, we can see this overlay with his style. Now going back to our presentation here. All right. So why else is religion important? Let's take a look. Whoops, input. But before we go there, let's finish up what we were talking about here. So, Ted Cruz, is, he, he grew up Baptist. His father was a pastor, he was Catholic, and his father, as an immigrant, came to the United States and got involved in an evangelical church, and his father currently pastors a church. So Ted Cruz is very much part of the religious subculture in the country, and in Texas, the Baptist faith is big, big religion. Um, he stresses faith and religious liberty, which is one of his angles for how he rallies voters. He's talked about his own personal conversion experience, uh, how Jesus Christ has touched his life, how his faith shapes and informs all of his views, uh, social views, political views, foreign policy issues. John Kasich was raised Catholic, but now is a conservative evangelical Anglican. You know, Episcopalians can be quite liberal, but he's actually part of a breakaway group that's evangelical. And the church that he goes to is actually much more conservative than Donald Trump's church. And probably about as conservative as Ted Cruz's church. But Kasich himself has decided not to allow that to kind of restrict his range and his outreach. So he uses the language more of a moderate evangelical Christian, kind of a social justice evangelical, in order to reach out to voters across the aisle. And also to reach out to Catholic voters, since his background is also Catholic. So why is religion important in American politics? Most Americans report being religious. I mean, if you look at the most recent poll, a survey by the Pew Charitable Trust, 78%, excuse me, 78% uh, said they were Christian, which has dropped now down to 70.6%. So 70% of Americans claim they're Christian. Another 5.9%, 6% say they're Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or practice some other form of spirituality. So we're seeing a very high percentage of Americans are claiming they're religious. Atheists are at 3.1% of the population, and agnostics 4.0%. That's 7% total, atheist, agnostic. And then nothing in particular, which that has grown quite a bit, actually, 18%. So a lot of Americans now are identifying as religiously eclectic, and they're kind of blending their, their views. So why is a candidate's religious identity important? More than half of Americans say it's important that a president shares their religious beliefs. Half of the population, so anytime you go out to a campaign speech, half of that population is going to say religion is important to them. So you, you can't be dismissive of religion even if you yourself are practicing. And Bernie Sanders has done a good job of not alienating religious voters, even though he himself doesn't regularly go to religious services, which, which he's open about. But he is spiritual in his own way, as he said. Protestants. 68% say that a candidate's religious identity is important. Evangelicals, 83%. African Americans, 70% of African Americans say that a candidate's religious identity is important. Catholics, over half. And Hispanic Catholics, 72%. Now, why is this important? Because this is what we're going to see. Right now, the Catholic Church is going through a change. The church itself is becoming more and more, more Latino. Over 40% of the church today, Catholic Church is Latino. It's going to go to 50%. So, this overlay is going to impact Catholicism in America in general, in the overall population, in terms of its religiosity. Now, 55% versus 72%, this tells us that minorities, at least Hispanic Catholics, are much more likely to say that religion matters because of the politics. And that's why Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and others have always reached out to ethnic voters and used religion to it, for it. And, uh, the, the cover of my book, Religion, Race, and, Barack, and um, Religion, Race, and American Presidency, 2008, has a picture of Bill Clinton at a Pentecostal church convention. That's what he would do. He would go out to these conventions and he would speak to black churches and Latino congregations, reach out. Okay. Why else is religion important? Catholics and evangelicals are more likely to support a candidate who shares their faith. 
This is why Hillary Clinton says she's, she's United Methodist. It's the largest mainline traditional denomination in the United States. The ba Southern Baptist is the largest evangelical group. So it doesn't hurt you to have this affiliation. Plus, she grew up that way, so why would she run from it? That would be her kind of thinking. Now, look at where do we see the evidence of the importance of religion in the, in, on Super Tuesday? Let's just race over here real quick. So overall, percent to say religion is very important. These are more Democrats though. So in Alabama, in Alabama Democrats, 84% say religion is important. Arkansas, 67% of Arkansas Democrats say religion is important. Georgia, 61% of the two states that the Democrats have won the two off. 61% of Georgian Democrats say religion is important. Um, Oklahoma, 53%, Tennessee, 63%, right? All, all doors close with the state of Jones State, the state of State. This is part of the reason why. This is very important. 58% of Texas Democrats, these are Democrats, these are not Republicans. 63% of, of Democrats in Virginia, a really key swing state, say religion is important. The total average, 63% of all Democrats nationwide say religion is important. That's, these are important figures. So why does religion matter? Because it matters in a lot of states, some of which are key swing states. What about Republicans? That would be really off Trump. But religion matters. 72%, 55%, 72%, 58%, 69%, 58%, 72%, 80%, 66%, 67%, 66% average. So for Republicans, it's, they're 15% more likely to religion is important. The average voter, 66%. These are big percentages. If you're running for office, you've got to pay attention to this. That potential minefield, even if you don't care about the content of things. That's how we be tough for an atheist to win. These numbers may be tough for an atheist and agnostic to be elected president. On both sides of the aisle, by the way. So religion matters. It's in quiet place. My thesis is that most Americans are quietly spiritual or religious or open to something else. Quietly spiritual. They don't talk about it too much. It's important to them. You get to know them well, your friends, because all this research indicates most Americans are spiritual. Barack Obama, in his book, The Audacity of Hope, said 94% of Americans are spiritual or religious. Barack Obama. That's why he was the first Democrat in 20 years to include a chapter on faith in his autobiography. Hillary Clinton followed suit. Why? He said, learn lessons from George W. Bush, who put religion and race front and center. Now, the Democrats are always good on race. But the religion piece, there was a God gap. There's a new book out. There's a book out called The Democratic God Gap. They've, had a, they've struggled with religious voters. And you say, well, why do they, why do they who cares about religious voters? Because Democrats are secular, right? No, they're not. The data indicates that they're not secular. An average of 56% nationwide of all Democratic voters are actually, actually religious. And they say it actually matters a lot to them. They're not, they're not religious. They say it matters a lot to them. The percent is even higher if those say they're religious. So really, really key to keep in mind if you're running for office. Why might the reported decline of religion be a political issue? Is the decline of religion a bad thing in America? Look at what the US population said. 65% of all Protestants, yes. Evangelicals, 74%. Mainline Protestants, liberal Protestants, yes. White Catholics, 59%, Hispanic Catholics. So a majority of the population says that the decline of religion is a bad thing. So if you're going to create a party platform, you don't want to be focusing on that issue and celebrating it. It doesn't help you. It's, it's, it's a net loss politically. It's a liability for you. So which political party does religion tend, the religion variable tend to favor? Republicans. And why? Because they're seen as more friendly to faith issues. Not just the abortion issue or um, same-sex marriage. Those are separate issues. Just in general, there's a perception that Republicans are more friendly. Obama help chip away at that a bit. Why might the religion variable help Hillary Clinton? Because she's seen as a lot more religious and open to religious people than Bernie Sanders is, in part because of Bernie's own identity. Bernie Sanders could do more to shore up this religious vote among Democrats, in my opinion. Why might it help Cruz? Because they seem as a lot more open to the religion issue. Evangelical voters today make up one third of the electorate, 36% of the electorate says they're born again or evangelical Christian. You have to pay attention to that number, why? Among Democrats, evangelicals are the fourth largest, largest constituency. Republicans have four groups, 
They have to have in order to win. Democrats have 10. So the African-American vote and the evangelical vote are the same size in terms of their value for a winning Democratic coalition in the presidential election. 2008 was an exception when more blacks voted than normal, but on an average voting cycle, they're the exact same size. Democrats win between 20 and 30% of the evangelical vote every time. They win between 20 and 30% of evangelical voters, Democrats do, because many of them are. Bill Clinton was, was an evangelical, Southern Baptist. Jimmy Carter was Southern Baptist. George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Ronald Reagan were all mainline Protestants. Now, how do you like that? That's, that's irony. So the president's their denominational affiliation is not what you would expect. It's just the opposite of how they won. That's part of how they won, though. They could appeal the vote. OK, closing up now. So I'm going to skip through this part. Talked about Latinos already. So I want to go right to the questions. Let's, let's do this one. Let's do this. So pathways to victory. So how could Bernie Sanders, let's open up for questions now. How could Bernie Sanders pull out a victory on election day? What do you think? Thoughts? Let's spend about 10 more minutes. How could he do it? Let's start with Bernie Sanders, then we'll go to Cruz. Then we'll, we'll cycle back around to Hillary and Trump. What do you think? In light of the data that we've seen on race and religion, I've given you some data now, you could use it. Now you're a political advisor. You were just hired. Your first job out of the Claremont Colleges, advising Bernie Sanders. What do you tell him to do on religion and race? Uh, appeal to Latino and black voters. OK, and how would you do that for Bernie Sanders? How could he do that? Um, hold more rallies, get more um, Latino and black people to be involved maybe on the campaign, or just like as simple as like spreading more of the message to um, focus on Latino and black issues. OK, good, good. What else could Bernie Sanders emphasize to, to reach out to minority voters? Someone else jump in here. I see two hands. Okay. Um, I, guess, I guess you could emphasize that his policies are uh, like on the far spectrum of the traditional democratic policies in which way they would, ho they would help low-income black and other minority voters and I think like that's a connection that many people make but it seems like those voters themselves aren't making that connection that he yeah. epitomizes some of the things that they love the most about the Democratic Party as, as voters so I think that he needs to you know make that connection even more uh, adamantly excellent point others how else could Bernie Sanders tap into the racial minority vote and the religious vote no one talked about religion yet now, Bernie Sanders himself is not institutionally religious, but you heard him say he believes spirituality. So how does Bernie Sanders do that with integrity? Uh, well, in the clip you showed us, he emphasized the commonality among religions. So I don't think he necessarily has to align himself with one religion. He just okay. has to emphasize the commonality, the golden rule. So really stress that point. Good. Who else had their hand up? I saw Natalie over here. And then, yes. Um, maybe he doesn't necessarily have to, like, maybe play up the God thing a little bit in the commonality, like he was saying, but also just being, maybe instead of being in, like, town halls, going to churches instead. Maybe oh. not really changing what he's saying, but changing the venue. Interesting. Change the venue. Bill Clinton was a master at that. And Hillary will, will be quite good at that, too, by the way, because she was with her husband the whole time, yes. Bring on a vice president that appeals to uh, minority voters or to women voters. Yes, he could pick a Latino or African American or a woman, right? To be his, his VP candidate or VP running mate and announce it early. I know that's subversive to the establishment, but announce it early. What has he got to lose except the primary? And millions of dollars, <laughs> millions and millions and millions of dollars are going to be lost if he doesn't win. And now it's, hey, I'm going to tell you straight up who I'm going to pick. Because right now, the math isn't looking good for him. I mean, he's really running an insurgent campaign. I mean, it's really picked up a lot of steam. But if you just do the delegate count and count the super delegates, they're really going to, right now, they're lining up for Hillary Clinton. But his, the last three states went for Bernie. You've got to do something outside the box, something that's going to jumpstart it. Anyone else? On that question? Okay, so how does Hillary solidify her, how does Hillary pull ahead of Bernie? 
just boom, this is over. What, what does she do? What can she do? Somebody needs to support Hillary here. What can she do? Okay, got it back there, yes? In uh, a lot of the debates, she always mentions how she's aligned herself with President Obama and his policies. So um, if she continues to draw that commonality, um, maybe she could build on his success that President Obama had in the election with minority voters. Good. Um, he was very good on religion and race. Obama ran a brilliant campaign in 2008. 2012, he struggled a lot. But 2008 was a brilliant campaign on that issue. What could he do? What else could Hillary Clinton do to, to really solidify the religious vote, which she's kind of struggling with. If she goes up against Cruz, it's going to be a problem because Cruz is going to draw the contrast with her on religion very sharply. And he could even use the race piece a bit. He's not done that yet. What else could Hillary do to solidify that? Anything else? Yes. Um, to sort of prepare for the general election, I suppose. This would help in the primary, too, I, I, I'd suppose. But, uh, but, but, um, but I, I would suggest appealing to, relig to uh, religious people on the, in the middle, the, the, the center of the political spectrum. Yes. Because we've seen in a lot of uh, cases, the moderate, like just whoever, just whoever gets those swing voters usually wins. That's a key part. And a lot of those swing voters, by, by the way, are they're Catholic. They're also Latino. In Florida in 2012, 46% of the undecided voters were evangelical. Latino evangelicals swing a lot in the state, and they're growing by 600,000 people a year because of conversion out of Catholicism. I, I passed through those data points very quickly. But there's a growth of evangelicalism. But, let, but minority evangelicals vote Democrat, usually. They don't vote like white evangelicals. On social justice issues, they're more progressive. Uh, on certain issues, they're kind of more conservative. Now, what about Donald Trump? So how does Donald Trump regain his footing. Remember now, you're all high-paid consultants now. How does he regain his footing? Don't be bashful. I, this is, we understand it's not your view. It's just the view that you're taking. Yeah. Me again. Uh, I think his reputation with Latinos is beyond saving, but with African Americans, I think he still has a chance. OK, all right. You think with African Americans? Uh, with Latinos, it's tough. It's going to be tough, real tough, yes. Um, I think, again, we're mentioning the Sanders running mate, I think that Trump has the opportunity ah. to distinguish or ca calm some of the fires around him with a smart running mate. Who choice. could he pick? Who could he pick? The exact, yeah, not definitely Sarah not Palin. Sarah Palin. And, but you know, there were, some, there were some comments about Christie, but I think that'd be horrible because I, like, there's no difference between them. Like, if they can, if what if can, Trump picked Susana Martinez from New Mexico? Would that be a rabbit out of the hat? Susanna Martinez, she's, she's a tough governor from New Mexico. I know some, I don't know if there are, but she's, she's won a number of governorships. She's a woman. She's Latina. She puts New Mexico in play. Colorado's a bordering state, right? Maybe. I mean, what is Trump going to do? Any other ideas about Trump? Let's be creative here now. A good consultant is bipartisan, right? They, they work with anybody. Yes, Natalie. And we'll finish I mean, up in three minutes. We'll be maybe done. something that could be emphasized more that's more in the general but not the primary is more foreign policy. Uh -huh. If he could like clean up his foreign policy act and maybe not focus on the things he's been focusing on, but instead on more on Europe and the Middle East, um, okay. he could potentially take away a lot of um, voters if it were to be Sanders, um, who's like pretty um, moderate as opposed to Clinton, who's pretty conservative on the Middle East. So. Well, it's interesting to see how the Sanders voters would go if he doesn't win. So we know that I, those that are committed to the party establishment were going to probably clearly go to Hillary. But those that are kind of getting involved for the first time, they might flip over and vote for someone like Trump because they just want someone who's an outsider. Not necessarily Claremont College students, but just, just the average person who's got involved. They want someone who's different. So we have to be able to, to be aware of these realities. And what about Cruz? Cruz is running an insurgency campaign, didn't have the money of a billionaire. And people, nobody really paid much attention to him early on. It was Bush and Rubio. Cruz has kind of zoomed past the rest. How does Cruz pull the feet out from Trump? And by the way, I think that might be possible, actually. It's, it's tougher for Sanders. Well, looking at the data that you showed us about religion, 
Um, and Ted Cruz is the strongest on religion, and Trump yeah. is kind of in a middle wishy-washy place where kind of like Sanders kind of just says something about religion. Cruz, if he could really hammer home all the evangelical Republicans, then maybe the gap will be closed. If he can get like 100% of that group, then he could have success beating Trump. Romney took 78% of evangelical voters in 2012. McCain took 72%, Bush took 78%. So Romney would have, I mean, no, excuse me, he'd have to, Cruz would have to take probably 85%. But I think who he should target are mainline Protestants and moderate Catholics, conservative Catholics. There are mainline Protestants that are actually conservative in the Midwest, other parts of the country. And there are Catholics that are moderate conservative too. Cruz, if he toned down his message, went to the center, hard, hard center push after he's got the nomination locked up in some way and really played on that heavy, then I think he might peel off two to four percent in certain in key swing states. What could he do on on race though, Cruz? We'll go Cruz in case I can move. Then we'll wrap up here. What else could Cruz do? In terms of race, Cruz could start giving speeches in Spanish. Cruz could start going out to the ethnic minority communities and just being visible there a lot more and making a real concerted effort, he could start with the churches. You see, the way Bush reached out to the ethnic communities, he went through what I call the back door of politics. He went to the church, which for Republicans, it just didn't do it. The Democrats had been doing it for a long time. Bill Clinton did it. He, he was famous for doing it. But Bush never did it. Bush Sr. didn't do it. So Bush went through the minority community through the church. So if, if Cruz went to the black evangelical churches, the black mainline churches, to Latino mainline evangelical churches and Catholic churches that are moderate conservative in New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, he might be able to pull away two to four percentage points. Not a lot, but enough to keep him in play. Yeah. Is it all right if I ask a question just related yeah. to this? So the, I was thinking about this. There is a perception that the Republican Party represents the majority white population's interest. Mm -hmm. So what are the dangers involved for a candidate appealing and ostracizing members of the Republican Party who do believe that yeah. and appealing to minority? Do you think that there's a risk of fracture? There is a, there's a risk that some whites might leave, and this will be the last question, I'll just wrap up. There is always the risk, but where are they going to go? The hardcore Republican establishment is never going to back a Democrat. So they have to go independent, but they want to win. So they're, they're, they're also very pragmatic. Don't forget that most... Republicans historically have been evangelical, but also mainline Protestant and Catholic. They're very practical. They want to win the election. I also think a lot of uh, white Americans, real Americans of all stripes, are very open on race. Just because they're Republican doesn't mean they don't care about race and ethnicity and poverty. It just means that they've been labeled the people who don't care. So they have to revision this. I went to an event on with this in 2014 called Rebranding the Democratic Party at Ariana Huffington's house. Norman Lear was there, Vincent, uh, Norman Lear, Joan Blades, MoveOn.org, Gary Hart, the Kerry re-election team was there, uh, Meg Ryan, I mean, just a bunch of people, Hollywood and political foes, 30 people. And they said, we just lost the election. It was December of 2004. They were shocked, and they were mad. They said, we have to rebrand ourselves because we've been branded as not being sympathetic to the religious issues, and we've not been good at reaching people. We got outfoxed by Bush in many ways. And so there was, there was a whole day spent, it was a whole seminar, all day. There were breakout sessions about how to rebrand the party establishment. And that's what they did. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama rebranded it and went after religion and really consolidated the racial component. And I think if the Republicans did that, someone like Cruz could get away with it. If, if Trump did it, it would be seen as kind of perfunctory. It'd be hard to believe right now. If he did too much of it. Kasich could do it, but Kasich right now has no way to win unless it's a brokered convention, at least as I understand the math. It'd be very hard for him to win. Um, but Cruz could. So Cruz has the ability to do something different. He could talk more about his ethnic identity, too, once he wins that nomination. The struggle of being an immigrant, the struggle of, 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 of being multi ethnic. All of this would appeal to many Americans that are in the middle. Most of America is in the middle on election day. And I think that could be the path to victory for him, for Bernie Sanders, Hillary, for Donald Trump, 
um, and for uh, Cruz and Kasich, they're going to have to go more to the center and find a way to reach out to those constituencies that they don't normally reach or that are asking questions about them, thinking about switching the party. So I want to thank you for your time. Today we talked about religion and race, why it might be important 2016 election. Thank you for your questions and your input. Thank you.